I want to do something that uh, I have not done in almost 38, almost 38 years of ministry. I've never done this. After 38 years of ministry and coming up on 27 years of marriage, I'm going to be doing a, a relationship series this month. I'm going to be doing relationship series, and uh, I'm going to call it Relationship Rescue. Yeah, finding hope in every season. Well, Pastor, why are you talking about that? Well, truth be told, well, it's, it's not biblical. It's not Bible. Well, truth be told, the whole Bible is a love story. From Genesis to Revelation, all you're reading is about the love of God for man. All you're reading about is love lost and love reclaimed. All you're reading about is redemption and all the various vicissitudes and challenges that relationship goes through. You are seeing it being played out in the Bible as God shares with man the relationship he has with him that is sometimes testy, that is sometimes challenged, that is sometimes heartbreaking and disappointed. But God's love for man is so strong that he still redeems us. And so I can't read the Bible and ignore relationships. And so what I'm going to be doing to make this impactful, I'm not going to try to pack it all in one Sunday, right? What I'm going to do, I'm going to take every Sunday this month and deal with a different stage or aspect, right? I'm going to be talking about being single, being married, being divorced, and being remarried. I'm going to take some time to give insight, advice, Amen. Walk through biblically those things and hopefully it'll impact your life. All right. And why am I doing this? I'm doing it for three reasons. Number one, um, over the years, I've spent countless hours um, ministering to people about various issues. And the largest majority of those issues revolve around relationships or lack thereof. Out of all the issues that I counsel people on, whether it be money, health, healing, finances, theology, faith, most of the counseling that I've done, even now, revolved around uh, relationships, you know, either having it or not having it, trying to get it, trying to find it, trying to keep it, <laughs> amen? So, so I can't ignore what's happening right among us in this shout when there are so many people who are struggling in the area of their relationships, I've talked to people who are very, very successful in other areas of their life, but you can't tell because they're so brokenhearted over the state of their relationships that it steals from the success that they have. We're going to talk about it. Secondly, secondly, you better be ready for this. Secondly, from a personal standpoint, um, I have been in each of these stations. I've been there. Single. Well, all of us come in single, truth be told. <laughs> we all come in single. But an adult single... Married, divorced, and remarried. Somebody got tight. I hope, I hope that doesn't turn you off. I hope, I hope that you can handle a pastor who has lived life. Yeah, and, and so when I talk to you, I'm not talking to you from the standpoint of something I read or something I've heard. Although it will be flavored with a lot of the experiences and counseling that I've had. But I'm also talking from somebody who has experienced all four of these states in my own life. So it's not designed to be judgmental. It's designed to be helpful. Single, married, divorced, and remarried. Now, so, just so you can calm down, Pastor T and I, yeah, I got I to gotta fix it. <laughs> Pastor T and I are walking up on what will be 27 years of marriage this year. 27, yeah, you can clap. 27 years. Now, there are people here who've been married longer than that. I'm just talking about my 27 years. Amen? And, and I appreciate God for that because some people can't stay married 26 weeks. Some people can't stay married 27 days. Hallelujah. <laughs> right? And it bothers me. Listen, it takes, it takes six to eight years to become a PhD in a particular area of, of, of study. And so it bothers me in this sea of information that people will be married six months and you want to do a marriage seminar. 
Yeah, you just got married 90 days ago, and now you want to tell everybody in the world how to be married. Well, I'm no disrespect. What you say might be right, but it has no experience behind it. It has no credibility. So I figure after 27 years that I've, 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 I've served enough time, <laughs> that I, I've served time enough that I can speak on the subject with some integrity. You follow what I'm saying? It's not that I'm against people who have things to say, but sometimes things have to be proven. So I'm not going to be just sharing my successes. I'm going to be sharing the things I did wrong in all four of those stages that I've made mistakes, right? I'm, I'm going to be vulnerable and transparent with you guys enough to share my scars and hopefully help you find hope. That's what it's about, finding hope in this season in your life. And finally, from a practical perspective, Bud JP, uh, it's cuffing season. I looked at you because you're single. I did look dead at him. It's cuffing season. Yeah, y'all. Come on, single people. Why are y'all fronting on me? Act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, this is the time of the year people want to be locked down, locked up, booed up. Hanging out somewhere, hibernating for the winter. And so I just want to help you as you go into this season to navigate it so that we don't have no problems come spring. <laughs> Y'all ready for this? I'm, we're going to have fun. We're going to have fun. Just relax. Breathe in. Breathe out. Come on. In fact, do this for me. Do this for me. Pull out your phone. Pull out your phone. Pull out your phone. Pull out your social media device and go to your social media platform. Instagram. Facebook, amen, TikTok, whatever. And I want you to share, I want you to share this post. Just go there. Take a moment right now. Pull your phone out. Pull your phone out. See, it's only in church that people get scared to pull their phone out. You go to a concert, child, a phone be all in the air and everything with flashlights and everything. So pull your phone out. It's okay. Because maybe you don't need this. Maybe you're not even interested in this. But for somebody you're connected to or talking to or working with, this may help them. So I want God to use you as an electronic evangelist. Take some pictures. Take some photos. Uh, share it from the Facebook page and say, I'm at the Impact Church in Nashville, and we are in a relationship rescue. My, my pastor is throwing you a life raft. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, yeah amen. Because it's in here right now. There's turmoil in this room right now. Yeah. Struggle. Dressed up and cute and everything, but struggling. Single folks, married folks, divorcees, and then those who are contemplating getting remarried. Well, amen. <laughs> We're going to talk to you anyway. <laughs> All right? So listen, listen. This first installment, this first installment is going to be called Living Single. Yeah, yeah. Somebody thought of singing. Yeah, it's going to be called Living Single. Now, notice I said Living Single. Not dying single. Because some of y'all approach being single like it's a death sentence. You just, you just, you just marching down the last mile on the way to death, right? Right? That's how you treat it. Like it's a season that I'm going down to the grave and oh my God, if I don't find somebody, I'm just going to die out in these streets. I'm just going to die out here. And so you approach being single like it's a death sentence instead of the gift from God and getting the most out of it. If I sound passionate about it, I am. Because so many people that I counsel over the years approach it like, oh, my God, if I don't hear him get somebody, I'm going to die. Give me a man. Give me a woman. Lest I die out here. And so because of that, you're not taking full advantage of this season in your life. I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32 and 34. You ain't got to stand up. We're going to jump around a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you're not familiar with it, you should be familiar with it. If you are single and saved, you should be familiar with this because uh, let's, let's read it first. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32. A man who is not married yep, is busy with the Lord's work. Some are already fainted. <laughs> trying to please the Lord. So who am I talking to? I'm talking about unmarried individuals. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about you with your boo thing, you with your living partner. I'm not talking about your main squeeze. 
I'm not talking about, you know, the, the person you're into right now. I'm not talking about Mr. Right Now. I'm speaking specifically to people who are unmarried. You are not legally married in the eyes of the law. I'm not talking about this. We've been together so long, we might as well be married. <laughs> it's going to be tight, but it's going to be right. He that is unmarried is busy with the Lord's work, trying to please the Lord. Verse 34, a woman who is not married or a girl who has never been married. If it sounds a little bit funny, it's because I'm reading out a new century vision, new, new century version. So it might sound a little bit different. I'm going to read it again. A woman who is not married or a girl who has never been married is busy. There's the opposite word, busy. Somebody shout busy. I'm busy with the Lord's work. She wants to be holy in body and spirit. So Paul is here dealing with unmarried persons, and he's, talk, he's talking about their devotion to the Lord, and get this, their ability to attend to him without distraction. Right? Giving priority, giving attentiveness, and giving deference to him like you would a spouse. If you're somebody who does not like accountability, you don't need to be married to anybody. Because there is built into marriage accountability. So if you somebody don't like nobody calling you, checking on you, texting you, asking you questions, you don't want to get married. Because the whole idea of being married to somebody is that you give that person deference. You give that person attention. You make that person a priority. And God is saying, I want you to give me that kind of devotion. If you're a single person, I hear some people use the scripture to say, well, I'm married to the Lord. Or I'm married to the Lord's work, right? I'm, I'm, I'm single right now, and I'm busy, busy, busy with the work of the Lord. I am attentive to him. I make him my priority. I give deference to him. He is first in my life. He is the most important person in my life. Everything about my life tends to lean towards what he wants, what he needs. I'm going to talk to the married people next week, but this is part of the problem with married people because you got married to somebody, but you got married thinking about your needs and not their needs. And some of you in this single season, God is training you right now. If you can't be faithful to him, you're not going to be faithful to them. If you can't give deference to a God who is as good to you as he is, as faithful as he is, as supportive as he is, if you can't be attentive to him and meet his needs and be there for him and worship him and give him glory and make him number one, don't tell me you're going to make a good spouse. Because you're getting practice right now. Oh, facing, you're coming too strong. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make these lessons long. I'm going to try to keep these down to like 30 minutes. So just breathe in, breathe out. <laughs> All, right? All right? I just want to lay some groundwork. So let me ask you this, those of you who say, the Lord is my husband and I'm married. Let me ask you a question. If the Lord is your husband, where are you? And why can't he find you? The whole band is single, but they left me. If the Lord, your, <laughs> get them in here and say, come hear this word. Yeah, tell them, come on out the lobby. You need to hear this. I see Tao, you over there. <laughs> if the Lord is your husband, my dear, why can't he find you? The volunteer pool should be filled with single people. Because you have more flexibility and you have availability than married people do. You follow what I'm saying? Where are you? You, you, you have more time. You have a, I'm not talking about like living at church. That's not what I'm saying. Come on, y'all. Use common sense. I'm not talking about living at church. I'm not talking about every time you open the church doors, you're there. I'm not talking about not having a life and not having balance. But what I am saying is by comparison, when you talk about all the other things that fill up your life compared to what you give to God, there is a serious deficit. And you got your husband calling you right now saying, where are you? <laughs> child of saints outside. That's what they are, Amber. The child of saints is outside. They, 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 they doing everything but God. Child, they getting flued out. Okay. The, the old folks just fainted. Ask your young adult, your young person, what flued out means. Yeah, I, yeah, they, they do it every day. They're, they're everywhere. It seems like they have availability for everything and everybody but God. 
If, 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 if Honey Boo calls you at 12 o'clock at night, you'll sit up with him till 3 in the morning, even though you got to work at 5 o'clock and don't mind. But if God wakes you up at 3 o'clock in the morning and says, I want to talk to you, you can say, God, call me about 9 o'clock. I'm sleepy. <laughs> oh, it's going to be tough up in here. So it seems as if we're available. We got all this time and all this energy. Single people, let's stay in the lane. You got all this energy and all this time for everything but God. He gets the least of you. He gets what's left. He don't get the best. He doesn't get deference. He doesn't get preference. He gets what you got when you got something left over. After I've done everything I wanted to do with everybody else I wanted to do with, everywhere I wanted to go, if I have anything left, God, you can have that. Oh, my God. I, I, I wasn't planning on talking about this, but, I was, but I'm going to throw this in here. I was reading about, about Ruth and Boaz, and everybody always used Ruth and Boaz as the quintessential example of what it means to be uh, a woman in waiting or a woman that's serving. And Boaz, being the owner of the field, sees her and, and, and wants to marry her and that sort of thing. But I want to give a little bit of color. I want to give a little bit of color to that story. Because when I read it, if you look at Ruth chapter 3, verse 10, the Boaz praises Ruth, right, for being a virtuous woman, right? He talks about her being a virtuous woman, but he also, but, but what you have to understand is that when we talk about Ruth working the field, she wasn't the only woman working the field. There were other women working the field. There were other women out there who were serving, who were working, who were busy, who were diligent. She wasn't the only one in the field. So it wasn't like she stood out because she was the only one there. But there was something about her character that stood out to him. In verse 10, he says this. He says, I noticed that you didn't chase the young man, rich or poor. Read your Bible. Pull it out. It's right there. So it's not just that she was working. It was what she was doing while she was working. She wasn't somebody, let me put it in modern vernacular because they're not getting me. She wasn't for the streets. I don't know why y'all act like y'all don't hear these terms all the time. You see how they did me, Leah? What? What he saying? You know exactly what I'm saying. She wasn't somebody whom he noticed. You wasn't somebody who was chasing. Chasing. She was a young widow. She realistically had the right to be involved or entertain of the young men, but she didn't because she wasn't chasing pants. She was chasing purpose. Y'all not going to get with me today. She wasn't somebody, <laughs> she wasn't somebody running around trying to figure out, are you my husband? Are you my queen? Are you my prince? She had her mind set on a particular person who was the Kingsman Redeemer, and she ignored, she dissed, she ghosted, she walked right past everybody else who would have been a distraction because her mind was on purpose. Let me ask you a question, young people. What are you chasing? She wasn't swiping left and swiping right. And she wasn't. <laughs> now, listen, I'm not I'm not getting on you. If you use dating apps, that's your business. I'm not. I'm just saying that she wasn't so distracted with trying to find a boo that she lost focus on what she was there to do. Her mentor instructed her that if your life is going to improve, you got to be connected to the Kingsman Redeemer. And so she wasn't just getting everybody a turn up in here up in here she was focused on a particular kind of person a particular purpose my god my young single people in here what are you focusing on what are you putting your energy into y'all tight Ooh. lord have mercy what are you after I'm, let me say this to you see what you have to realize is that if you're somebody who spends all of your energy chasing people chasing people. Somebody of quality is standing in the corner right now watching you. And they sit back saying, mm, ain't that something? Every time I see a Facebook post, she with somebody. A different somebody. Every time she posts something, she's been flewed out somewhere. 
every time. He, he ain't saying nothing. She ain't saying nothing. She's way back in the corner in the cut, right? Because I doubt, my brother, my young brother, that you're going to find a queen in a strip club. I doubt very seriously is you're going to find her standing at the bus stop sucking on a lollipop. Y'all ain't ready for me. Yeah, Y'all ain't ready for me. Y'all ain't used to be being like this. This is going to be raw. We ain't tuning or nothing. We're going to just hit you right dead in the face. I, I doubt very seriously, you're going to find a woman of substance doing something. She, you, you're probably going to find her at the library with her face in a book. You're probably going to find her at a conference somewhere trying to figure out how to get her paper up. You're probably going to find her somewhere trying to get her life improved. You're not going to find her sitting around being idle and doing nothing. Where are my quality people at here? Where are my quality women at? You ain't going to pick me up on the corner somewhere like I'm cheap. I was in Las Vegas, Connie, and I noticed that it, there were certain stores, when I went to Rodeo Drive, there were certain stores that you had to pre-qualify and make an appointment just to get in the store. You had to prove that you were at a certain income level, listen, just to get in the store. You couldn't just walk in and say, hey, I want to try this on. It was so expensive. It was such a high level that you had to make an appointment and to prove that you had a certain income. There are certain, I sell real estate. There are certain houses that are sold by celebrities and famous people that you have to prove that you have a certain amount of money just to see the house. You can't just walk in like it's Walmart. Walmart can afford to let you walk around and just try stuff because it's cheap. You can try it on, walk around the store, put it back. Some of the stuff y'all tried on may have been tried on by eight different people before you bought it. Because it's cheap. And cheap stuff get to be handled by a lot of people. But stuff that is quality. Y'all not listening to me. People that are quality, you ain't going to be had by everybody. There's a certain level of vetting that you have to go through just to get a date with me. I don't know why y'all sitting on me. It can't be every Joe that walk by and whisper in your ear saying, come on, go on a date with me. You got to save your time, your energy, your body, your sensibility for somebody who's at least worth it. Every time you come to church, you come with a new person. Get out of here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Y'all getting something out of this already? I only got a few more minutes. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, y'all know it. Verse 1, it says there's a time for everything. A time for everything. And a season for every activity under heaven. Verse 11 says this. Everything is beautiful in its time. Oh, in other words, there's a right time for everything. It is possible to have something before you're ready for it. And doing the right thing at the wrong time is as bad as doing the wrong thing. Single people, I'm going to talk to you. I'm coming down your street. Picking fruit before it's ripe is never a good thing. Everything is beautiful when it's time and when it's not, it's ugly. It's beautiful when it's time. And when it's not, it can be ugly. When I first got married, I was 19 years old. I was barely out of high school, sophomore year in college, and decided to be somebody's husband. They say that young men's brains aren't even fully developed till they get in their first, in the, into their 20s, their mid-20s. And here you are insane in the membrane when you should have been earning your degree and getting your paper up. You're going to be somebody's husband. And it was ugly. <laughs> Nothing wrong with her. Nothing particularly wrong with me. It was just the wrong time. It was the wrong time. That just because you're of dating and marrying age doesn't mean you are spiritually or emotionally available to get married. Y'all ain't clapping in here. Just because you grown and got your own place don't mean you ought to take the step to being married to somebody. You're not married to be nobody's wife with your crazy self. <laughs> with your crazy, with your stubborn self, with your neck popping self. 
Can't nobody tell you nothing. Don't want to come home when you're supposed to. What you doing in my phone? Why are you calling me? Because we married. That's why. <laughs> Write this down. Being single is a season. And how you govern yourself in this season determines if it's tolerable or not. Notice this, that when the seasons change, what do you do? You dress accordingly. A few months ago, we was wearing shorts and, and flip flops and, and, and halter tops. God bless America. Uh, I don't know where that came from. You was wearing summer attire. That's what it was. You was outside. It was hot. It was 100 and something degrees. And, and now we're moving into a winter season. And you can stand out there and be mad and rail at the season and cuss at the season and be mad. I don't like this season. But the truth be told, all you got to do is change clothes. You just wear what is appropriate for this season. Some of you are not dressed for the season that you're in. In a season that God wants to get your attention, wants to get your focus, wants to get your mind. You are out here single with married people benefits. Nothing wrong with that in that season. But in this season, oh God, it's tight up in here. Lord Jesus. It's inappropriate. Just like it would be inappropriate for you to wear uh, swim attire to a formal event. Can you imagine that? It's a formal event. We're wearing gowns and tuxedos, or maybe it's a funeral where we're wearing appropriate attire and everybody's dressed a certain way. We're buttoned up a certain way. And here you come traspin in in a two piece bikini. You are out of order. You are inappropriate for the situation. Nothing wrong with the outfit. It's just the wrong situation. Nothing wrong with wearing a big, full, woolly cap with a big, fat coat on and boots if it's winter, but you look foolish wearing it when it's 100 degrees outside. So what am I saying with these metaphors is that's how some of you who are single look when you're trying to have a married experience in a single season. Oh, my God. And there they are controlling your life, your money, your body, your plans and everything all like that. And they haven't even signed any legal documents to say you got the right to say so. Baby, you in the wrong season. Oh, my God. You got to take advantage of this season. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Paul said this. He said, I have learned Philippians 411. I have learned whatever state I am in. To be content therewith. And a lot, of, a lot of single people struggle with finding contentment. That's what it is. I'm finding trouble. I'm having trouble finding that space of contentment. A satisfaction. Contentment is simply a state of satisfaction with a certain situation or season in your life. They are discontented to the point of distraction. You're obsessed with to the point of distraction. Every conversation you have is about being booed up. We can't have a business meeting with you without you bringing up that you're single. We can't do business, do ministry, serve beside you without you checking fingers to see if somebody's married. We, 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 can't, we can't even sign a contract or do anything that is lofty or higher or higher conversation because everything always delineates down to your single status. And you are distracted to the point of discontentment. Discontentment will rob you of your peace. Discontentment can lead you to bad choices in relationships. Truth be told, some of the people that you dated, you didn't really love them You just didn't like the idea of being alone. Oh, my God. It wasn't that you were so into them. It wasn't that they was just bomb. You just didn't want to be by yourself. And God helped them if they think you're really into them. You didn't really care about them or want to be with them. You was in love with, yeah, Lord, the idea of them, not the reality of them. 
And they are suffering under your uh, hateful behavior because they can't figure out if I'm with you, why are you being so mean to me? Because you didn't really care about them, their feelings, their goals, their ideas, their aspirations. You weren't really into them. They were just something you used to buy time. I'm just filling up space. I'm just tired of being uh, coming stag to events. I'm just tired of being the third wheel with my married couples. Come on and go with us. And there they are getting googly eyed at each other. And you sitting there having to endure all this public display of affection. And you think, oh, my God, when is my season going to be over? Can I tell you a secret? Some of the people that you call and hashtag relationship goals, they ain't happy either. Y'all ain't used to me talking. Y'all want me to preach. I'm trying to talk to you. They ain't happy either. So all these are hashtag relationship goals. You posted it on your stuff. Hashtag relationship goal. I want to be like Sierra and so and so. I want to be like Will and so and so. And a lot of the people that you're chasing behind, they ain't happy either. But I'm discontented. I'm discontent. I'm dissatisfied. I, I, I have no peace. And social media really robs you of your peace because as you look at everybody, they put in hashtag blessed. <laughs> hashtag blessed. And they putting out all these pictures. We're in Aruba. Amen. We're having dinner on the Miranda. We just bought a new car. He's proposing on one knee. We had everybody here celebrating us. And even when people get a new boyfriend, ain't talking about a husband, just a new boyfriend, we start talking about congratulations, congratulations, congr for what? For what? You ain't done nothing yet. You ain't signed no papers. You ain't made no vows. Cong a thousand congratulations because you went to dinner with somebody. Please. <laughs> I'm trying to help. I'm trying to help, brother. But you see that, single people, and you start feeling discontented with your life. You follow what I'm saying? So, so, so real quickly, I got 20 minutes left. I want to I want to list five thought processes that make this season intolerable for you. Because one of the reasons I think you're discontented is the things you say to yourself and how you view this season. You don't view it as a gift from God. You see it as a problem. And some of the things that you say to yourself is what, contri is what contributes to discontentment. So number one, write this down. A lot of people see being single as a prison to be released from. That's how you see it, like a prison. I'm just clink, clink. I'm locked down. And you hoping you get time off for good behavior. <laughs> If I be a good little boy, if I be a good little girl, God will release me from this prison. Can I say this? Being single is not a prison sentence. It's a preparing season. You don't just bide your time, but you maximize this time to become the best version of yourself possible. Y'all looking at me funny. That instead of you being distracted with trying to find the right person, you should be distracted with becoming the right person. I got enough work to do on me. That, so you try to fix people, cut people, manipulate people, try to make them fit your idea of the ideal person. When reality ain't nobody, no project. You are the project. Y'all not give me no amen. I, I, I told the Lord I, I shouldn't preach this stuff this month, but he said, go ahead. So I'm going with it. You so busy working on somebody else trying to make them fit your ideal picture of what they ought to be when you really ought to be working on you. Oh, my God. So let me come here. And some of y'all, some of y'all, what you're trying to do is you're trying to change yourself to attract a person. Yeah, I'm going to get snatched so I can get me a man. I'm going to get muscles so I can get me a woman. Truth be told, the only motivation you should be having to becoming your best version is you. And if you become the right person, then you'll attract the right person. Am I talking right in here? Are you bored? I'm just trying to help you a little bit. So you're so distracted with trying to change yourself to attract somebody. And everybody you date, you got to change and maneuver and change yourself and fit what their version of you ought to be. You don't even know who you are. 
I wore my hair blue because Billy liked blue, but I ain't dating him no more. Now I wear my hair red because Fred likes my hair red, but I ain't dating him no more. And I put on a little bit of weight because Johnny said he likes a big bone woman, but I ain't dating him no more. I'm dating Fred because Fred likes a, you changing to all these people. What about you? Number two. You see, you see, you see being single like a disease to be cured from. That's why you're discontented. You see it like a disease. You see being single like somebody who needs a, a kidney transplant. And if I don't get a boo, I'm just going to die. <laughs> Singleness is not a disease and marriage is not a cure. You ought to tweet that. You ought to post that. You ought to hashtag it. You ought to put it on your social media right now. Tell them I said it. Being single is not a disease and marriage is not a cure. But because you think that marriage is the cure for your loneliness, you are chasing after somebody hoping that they'd be Dr. Feelgood and fix this disease. Oh, I'm going to say it. 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 And listen, I'm going to tell you something else while I'm down the street. Whatever's ailing you as a single person, whatever issues you have, whatever weaknesses you contend with, I'm telling you, baby, marriage won't fix it. Marriage will not fix it. If you're crazy single, you're going to be crazy married. If you're unfaithful, disloyal, if you're somebody that can't be depended on, if you don't keep your word, those are character issues that will not be resolved because you put a ring on your finger. If anything, whatever you're contending with now will only get bigger once you get married. Where are my married people at? Y'all can feel free to back me up because they getting quiet. The single people are quiet. All my married people say amen, somebody. It's not going to fix it. It's not going to take it away. Changing your status won't change your spirit. If you haven't mastered self-control, if you have anger issues, if you are selfish, if you are stubborn, being married won't fix it. And if you can't be happy with yourself before you get married, getting married won't fix it. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Are you bored? Getting married won't fix it. But people dream, I'll be a better person if I just get married. I'm stubborn now. I'll cuss you out right now. But once I get married, I'll be a nice person. <laughs> it's PG, y'all. It's PG. You ain't got to cover your ear, your kids' ears. If, 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 if I'm struggling with, with my sexuality, if I'm struggling with my issues, once I get married, I'll be good. Yeah. If you don't have self-control as a single person, getting married is not going to make you blind suddenly. Hello, somebody. Getting married is not going to be suddenly. Ain't nobody attractive and ain't nobody going to hit on you and ain't nobody going to be trying to get your phone number. And if you don't have self-control now to be able to shut down certain people, you're not going to suddenly become a faithful person just because you got a ring on your finger. Come on, y'all. Y'all look at me like y'all don't know this stuff. Try to help the single people out in here. So don't, 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 don't fall for the okie doke. Don't fall for the okie doke. Don't get pulled into something thinking it's going to cure you because it won't. Y'all ready for some more? Number three, you see being single like a curse to be delivered from. That's why you don't like being single. It's a curse. It's only a curse if you're with the wrong person. It's a curse with the wrong person. And I get it because, because you know, married people sometimes be doing too much. Right? We'd be doing too much. What's the first thing they ask you when you're single and you're eligible? Why aren't you married yet? And what's the second thing they ask you? What's wrong with you? <laughs> so if you're legal age and you're eligible and you're attractive and you're smart and you haven't found your person yet, people look at you like, what's wrong with you? What's, what's, what's wrong with you? Like something wrong, yeah, I got some sense. Like something wrong with me? Something got to be wrong with me to be happy? 
like it's somehow cursed uh, because you haven't attracted the right person. There's nothing wrong with desiring marriage. I don't see anything wrong with it. The Bible says it's right. It's biological and it's biblical. But until then, until you found your person, what's wrong with being strong? What's wrong with being confident, happy, content, unbothered? <laughs> I saw this picture of a lady who was sitting somewhere in Mexico looking out on the veranda. She was having dinner by herself and she looked at peace and contented and she looked strong and people was on there putting negative comments. And when did it become wrong to be a a confident, self-assured person? When did it become wrong for a woman to have her own money? When did it become wrong, my brother, for you to have your own money and not have to move in with your girlfriend because you don't pay your bills and your credit is 400 and you don't keep a job? (laughs) Why something got to be wrong? Why I got to have a disease? Why I got to be looked at all strange and weird and odd because I don't want no drama in my life? Yeah, ain't nobody calling me up saying where you at, what you doing, how long you going to be there, when you getting back, baby, I'm good. If I want to go to Dubai, I'm going. If I want to stay out as long as I want to, I'm staying. I'm at where I'm at. I'll be back when I get back. That's the benefit of being single. (laughs) It's a crazy church. When did our society get so bad that even people who are not happily married want you to be happily, unhappily married too? Where misery wants company. I don't like my wife, so I want you to marry somebody you don't like either. So we can all sit around and complain about how much we hate our marriages. Get out of here! Until that person comes, there's nothing wrong we're being strong and confident and peaceful. I talked to one sister for a long, long time saying, why are you waiting on a man to buy a house? That was her constant conversation for years. If I was married, I'd have a house. You don't need a man to get, to get a house. You just need a decent credit score. Keep a job, pay some bills, and it ain't got to be a mansion. Get you a starter house. At least it's your house. Everything up in here is mine. And I that's mine right there. That couch is mine. That coffee table is mine. That coffee cup is mine. These drapes are mine. These pillows are mine. I get to walk around up in here and I got peace and no drama. Everybody got no drama. Holler at your boy and say, no drama. My single sister, my single brother, why are you dealing with drama and you ain't even married to that fool? I'm just asking. I'm just asking. He controlling your life and telling you what to wear and where to go and who you can be friends with. You ain't my husband. Until you put something on this finger, I'm going to do what I want to do when I want. Oh, Lord. I, this whole place ought to be shouting right now. All my single people holler at your boy if you know what I'm saying. Look at somebody and say, I'm blessed. I'm not cursed, baby. I'm blessed. Say it loud. I'm blessed. I'm not cursed. Number four, I'm almost there. I got 10 more minutes. You see being, ra- you see being single like a race to be disqualified from. You see it like a race. It kind of reminds me, some of you brothers will, 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 will relate to this. It reminds me of those baseball players who come running into home base and they slide into home base and they wait for somebody to stand on top of them and say, safe! That's how some of y'all are. I'm going to run. I'm going to run. I got to slide into marriage. Slide! slide on your belly. Slide! Shh, into marriage. I'm safe. You run like somebody chasing you. You're running after it like somebody is literally chasing you. Like you have an invisible opponent that when you wake up in the morning, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. Match.com, Facebook, Instagram, call my girlfriend. Da, da, da. I gotta find somebody. Your eyes are bucked. You're always looking. You, because you're running like it's a race. Oh my God, like I'm running out of time. That's how you approach being single. You don't approach it like this is an opportunity. You approach it like I'm running out of time. 
And if I die before I get married, I'm going to get in heaven and God's going to ask me, why didn't you get married? Like for real. You act like you go, you act like the crowning achievement of life is better to get somebody and then die and go to heaven as if God's going to ask you, why didn't you get married? What was wrong with you? What was on your mind that you didn't get married? That's not how that is. But because you think that that is a race, I got to run. I got to run. I got to cross the finish line before it's too late. Write this down. The goal is not to get married. The goal is to stay married. You are running trying to get somebody to the altar because to you, that's the crowning achievement. Safe. But the truth be told, because you were so busy running to the altar, you ran past red flags that you now have to live with because you weren't preparing for a lifetime. You were preparing for a day. All my flower girls and all my friends and all my cousins and all my neighbors, we're going to have a big old celebration and all the church people, we're going to march in because Mary finally got a man. And we have to wait for three hours dancing and jumping and having a good old time for something that don't last three months. Because you weren't preparing for a lifetime, you were preparing for a day. Because to you, it's a race. Who are you racing against? My girlfriend in high school? My cousin and them? Susie got married last week. I got to hurry up. I got to hurry up. I, gotta, I had one girl say to me, I got to get married before my best friend do. I said, so you, 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 you racing to get somebody just because you want to get married before she do? This is not a race to be disqualified from. And a whole lot of people I counsel, almost every one of them I talk to them, will say, I knew I shouldn't have done it. They don't say it at, 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 at the, at the pre-counseling. They don't say it at the wedding day. They look back on it after five years and say, I saw all the red flags and I stepped over it anyway. I want to talk to people and y'all back me up some married people. I want to talk to some of you who are stepping over obvious red flags. It is a waving red flag. He has snatched you up. And y'all just dating. He already don't answer his phone. And y'all just dating. He already got kids popping out the woodwork. And y'all just dating. He already borrowed money from you. Oh, but I got to run. I got to run. I, I, got, I, I got somebody. I'm going to run to the altar. Safe. Some of y'all think y'all safe. You just entered the drama zone. Yeah. Yeah. Almost everybody that I've, met, that I've counseled who were going through divorce can look back and say, I knew that. I knew she wasn't faithful. I was watching how she moved. All the signs were there. But I was so much in a rush. I did it. I'm not being funny. I did it. So in a rush to get somebody in there. You know, because I was from West Virginia. I got saved in West Virginia, right? I was a teenager when I got saved, right? And so in West Virginia, there was nothing else to do but get married. <laughs> I ain't going to lie. I, I was in a hole in this church. You couldn't watch TV. You couldn't listen to music. You couldn't dance. You couldn't go to the movies. You couldn't wear, the girls, you couldn't wear no, like the stuff y'all do today. Y'all would have been just thrown in hell for the stuff. <laughs> the whole church. <laughs> stuff y'all do now, boy. Y'all would have never made it back then. So it wasn't nothing to do but get married. It was like getting married was the only wrong thing we could do. It was the one thing we were allowed to do. Get married. Have somebody to be in the bed with. So all the young people was rushing to get married. They taught us erroneously. The scripture is right where it says better to marry than to burn. But they taught us erroneously about it because they made it seem like everybody 
in the whole singles ministry was just burning. Because I got to get married because I'm burning. Ah, ah, I'm burning. I got to get somebody. That's how, that's how we approached it. What Paul was really talking about is people who are in a relationship and they are burning in passion to each other. And if you are of legal age and you're of the opposite sex, oh yeah, oh yeah, and they're not married, either you or them, there's no legal reason why you shouldn't get married. So if you and I are in a relationship and we have entered to this place where there is passion there, where there's obvious compassion, I mean passion and connection there, there's nothing wrong with getting married. But what it doesn't mean is that you got to run around the church like matchsticks. <laughs> Don't get married. You're going to get burned up. You're going to get burned up. You mean to tell me you burning for everybody? Brother, you burning for every skirt that walk by? Every skirt that walk by? <laughs> Everybody, you got to get their number. Everybody, you got to be hanging out with everybody because you walk around. Oh, I'm, I'm, ah, oh God, help me. And in this season, you're just walking around like a matchstick. Oh, my God. I got oh, I got to find somebody. I'm burning. Oh, Jesus. They come to my alphas for counseling. I'm burning, Pastor. What am I going to do? Y'all look uncomfortable. Y'all, y'all looking so uncomfortable. I wish I could turn the camera around and show you yourself. Y'all looking like that. How I look? Yes. You walking like the human torch. Yeah, you are like the human torch. You come. I'm burning. Praise the Lord. Don't get near me. <laughs> and you're trying to quench. The passion of desire with marriage to the point that you have run straight into the arms of the wrong person. I wish somebody had told me. I wish somebody had told me, Carmen, that just because you feel something for somebody now, it may not necessarily mean you want to be with them for a lifetime. Y'all not saying amen. Y'all ain't getting nothing out of this? Y'all not saying amen? Last thing, and I'm going to move on. I'm almost done. i got five more minutes. You look at marriage like a low place to be elevated from. And here's how they say, oh, I'm in a low place right now. But when the Lord elevates me to being married, I'm going to be okay. You mean to tell me that you see being single as a low place? And I get it. I get it, y'all. Let, let, let me be fair and balanced. I get it. Because um, a lot of times, married people, and, and especially in church, we, we make single people feel like a, a second-class citizen. We do. We make them almost seem invisible. That sometimes we don't give them uh, opportunities to serve, nor do we give them opportunities to be in leadership until they are booed up with somebody. It's almost as if you have nothing significant to offer or nothing to say unless you paired up with somebody. So you can't be a smart person, an educated person, an intelligent person. You can't be a wise person. You can't sit at the table with the sages and have real conversation because the first thing they ask is, where's your husband? Or where's your wife? And so when we get ready to do things, we are often excluded from the conversation. We're going to talk to all the married people. All the married people are going to be on the board. All the married people are going to have positions of leadership. All the married people are going to be elevated to the place of, of, of leadership and power and authority. And because you are single, you happen to step over hurdles and prove yourself to people that you can be smart. And so now you're in an uncomfortable position of always having to prove that you're not after somebody's husband. All the married people are clutching their spouse, you know, just because you walked in the room. Their insecurity is put on you. And now I can't even walk in the room because you think I'm out there. You don't even want him. You don't even want him. Why do you think I want him? Come on here. 
crazy Fred with the mismatched socks on can't have dress. You think I want him? Child, please. So you can't even have a conversation with a married person because the married people are clutching their spouse like you're going to run off with them somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, so, so because they're uncomfortable with you being, and, and God help you if you're attractive, that's just a curse. If you just happen to be attractive, oh, you can just hang it up. Because now we're thinking you always got to be scheming. you always trying to steal something. you always wanting something. And so to protect themselves and possibly their relationship, they exclude you. They exclude you. They don't want to call you. They don't want to talk to you. They don't want to call on you. They don't want to put you in a position of leadership because to them, and it's saddening that you mean to tell me I'm not a significant person unless I'm tied to somebody. And a whole lot of people are tied to somebody that they really didn't want. It's just that I couldn't be in the group unless I came with somebody. And so my spouse is nothing more than an accessory. My spouse is nothing more than something I use to get in the room. Because if I didn't get married, they wouldn't let me lead the organization. They wouldn't let me be over the group. They wouldn't let me be over the band. They wouldn't let me be in leadership. They wouldn't let me be in politics. Why I got to fight like a crazy person to do what somebody else can do just because they're married. And so here come Mr. and Mrs. Jones and we march out there. We done fought all the way here. We can't stand each other. We don't like each other in the room. We stand in separate parts of the house. But as long as we come out and we present for everybody, it's all good. And so you'd rather have a caricature. You'd rather have a fake, phony relationship for the sake of a position. Am, am I being too heavy for y'all? I'm just trying to explain what single people are going through. All my single people holler at me if I'm saying the right thing. And you can't be taken seriously because you're single. Let me help you with this. If being single, if being married means being elevated from single. If you're not significant unless you are married to somebody. I heard somebody say on last week, online last week, that he can't respect a man if he's not married. And I thought, what? You can't respect me unless I'm somebody's husband? So I went to type it. I said, listen, brother, the two most significant men in the New Testament weren't married. Jesus and Paul. So you telling me that Jesus couldn't be the Lamb of God? You telling me he couldn't be the Savior of the world? You telling me he couldn't heal the sick and raise the dead? You telling me he couldn't counsel the woman at the well or open blinded eyes or cast out demons because he wasn't married? The Apostle Paul wrote over half the New Testament. He is the most quoted apostle in the whole Bible. He established all kinds of churches and set up sons and cast out demons and healed and delivered people. And you mean to tell me he is not a contributor because he is single? The devil is a lie. So I'm saying to some of you that are out there right now, don't use marriage as a reason to get married because you're worried about status. Elevation doesn't come from status. It comes from God. I'm going home. They don't want to hear this. Elevation comes from obedience. If you find somebody who is obedient to God, if you humble yourself in the mighty hand of God, God will exalt you in due season, whether you're married or single. All my single people ought to be shouting right there. I just sent you a freedom card. I just sent you a get out of jail free card. Stop letting people put their foot on you, their neck on you, and tell you you're not significant. I'm not preaching. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Humble yourself. What the Bible says. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Y'all, come on, come on. Humble yourself. Wherever God sees humility and God sees obedience, God will exalt you. He doesn't look at you and say, I can't lift you up because you're not married. You're in a single season. God knows. God knows you're in a single season. And I'm going to say this to you. Some of you, the issue is you worship marriage. 
You bow at the altar of matrimony. You worship it to the point of obsession. And here's what I want to warn you. God is not against marriage. He created it. But God is a jealous God. And he is not going to let you have somebody that you love more than him. The problem is God is not against your marriage. God is not against you being happy. God is not against you having a boo. God is not against you having somebody in your life. But the problem is that some of you worship marriage. And that is the problem. You're worshiping marriage and not the God who gave you the marriage. And you have more respect for the marriage than you have for the God. And God says, I'm jealous. I'm jealous. I didn't get into the scripture, but the Bible talks about how the married people, we'll talk to y'all next week. The married people, he that is married, cared for the things that belong to his spouse. How he may please him or her. You know, when, you, when you're married, you have dual interests. You have dual responsibility. You have your devotion to God and you have your devotion to the person that you're married to. That there are certain responsibilities that you have to have to the person that you said I do to. And God is not mad about that. You marry them, you take care of them, you honor them, they respect them. But you can't forget about God. But the problem with single people is you're giving married people benefits to people that you're not married to. God wants your devotion. Amen. Amen. Wonder what would happen if you got in a place with God. That you love God so much that God, if this is the season I'm in, I'm not going to be here frustrated. I'm going to prepare. I'm going to wait. I'm going to be sober. I'm going to be submitted. I'm going to be satisfied. Y'all see them t-shirts we got out there? That's what I'm talking about. Being sober. Get your head together. Get your head out the cloud. Get your head out of the foolishness that you've been feeding yourself. Be submitted to who? To God. Submit yourself to God. Submit yourself to God. And then be satisfied. Be satisfied in this season. That God wants to satisfy you totally and completely. That you are not an incomplete person because you don't have somebody sitting next to you. That God wants to bring you into a place of relationship with him that is so deep, that is so satisfying, that is so pure. You ain't met a man like him. Yeah. You ain't met, y'all look at me funny. You ain't met a man like God opens doors for you. Make a way for you out of no way. Fight off all of your enemies. Counsel you in the middle of the night. Catch your tears in a jar. Understands how you feel even when you can't talk. Will sit up with you in the middle of the night and say, I understand and I hear you and I love you. Who will let you make a mistake and will still stand beside you. Who will still be with you. Who will still bless you. Who will give you a good job and a good position that will heal your body. That will raise your kids. You're not talking to me. I'm talking about a God who sees all my faults and yet he sees my knees. I wish I had somebody who would stand on your feet and give God praise for being a wonderful counselor. Lift your hands and worship right here. I hear God saying, I want your attention. I want your attention. I want your attention. I want my time with you. I miss my time with you. I I miss having opportunity. I miss, turn me down some. I miss our long walks. I miss our long talks. I miss our conversations. I miss the times you would call me in the middle of the night. I wish the time, I miss the time when the first thing you would do is grab your Bible instead of opening up your Facebook. I miss the time you would blow kisses to me because you were just so glad I was in your life. I'm going to take 60 seconds right here. I want everybody who's, who's over 18, 18 to 25, I'm going to go to over 18, let me get 18. I want you on this altar right here, quickly, quickly, quickly. We've been talking about doing a young adult ministry, 
we're putting plans in place to have a marriage ministry because we want some place that can minister to you in this season in your life God wants to do so much through you God wants to do so much through your life there are things that God wants to accomplish in this season have you done everything that God has asked you to do have you really dug down and found out who you are and releasing your gifts and your talents listen the church is suffering the church is suffering for the lack of your availability from the lack of your availability child I gotta have a life I gotta have balance I get all that but how much of that time do you give to the kingdom I want conviction to fall on you today because in honesty there are a lot of things that you could be doing for the kingdom that the church should never suffer for volunteers we always got stuff to do we always got stuff need to be done we have, some of these married people when I call them I gotta pull them out of their beds and pull them out of situations and divide their time that they should be giving to the to their spouse when we make a call for volunteers you should be the first ones come on somebody so you might have to give up a date night or two so what he wasn't nothing anyway I'm just saying see him one to see them all <laughs> so you may have to turn down a trip somewhere so you may have to be home by yourself for a few more days longer than you want to but it will be better to be alone and be happy than to be tangled up and be miserable. Do you hear what I'm saying? God wants to stir up your gifts. Two o'clock in the morning and three o'clock in the morning, he'll be talking to you, stirring up your gifts. And you ain't got to worry about nobody getting disturbed or upset or annoyed or frustrated. God has brought you to this church because he wants to activate your gifts. We'll talk to the married people next week. But God said, start with the single people because this whole place should be running over with volunteers who are single. Where are you? If God is your husband, why can't he find you? Why you got to be looking all over the place trying to find you? Oh, child, I'm busy. I'm busy. Busy doing what? If some of you found something constructive to do, you wouldn't have time for something destructive. Y'all ain't giving me no play today. Some of you, it's not that you're bad people. It's just you got a whole lot of time on your hands. And when you don't have something significant to do, something purposeful, something meaningful, the devil will give you something else to do because there's no way that you can be idle. You're either doing something good or you're doing something bad. There is no middle ground. I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to help you. You got to fill up your time. I tell people they get saved all the time. If you're an unsafe person and you used to go into the clubs and getting high and running wild and then you get saved, you can't just stop stuff. You got to fill it with something. Everything you give up, you got to replace it with something good. If you don't replace it with something positive, it'll come back and it'll come back worse. Am I talking in here? Amen. Am I talking right? Amen. If you say I'm going to cut off Jimmy, you got to replace it with something positive. If you say I'm not going to drink no more, you got to replace it with the water of the spirit. If you say I'm not going to smoke no more, you got to replace it with something positive. Used to running all night long till two o'clock in the morning. I got something to do. Trust me, I got a grocery list of things that can be done in the kingdom. The harvest is plentiful. It's the laborers that are few. Because the saints outside. We outside. Now you're gonna bring them into me. And now I gotta perform an exorcism on somebody you should have never been involved with in the first place. But we outside. you're around this altar lift your hands to the Lord right here I'm joking and playing but I'm serious lift your hands to the altar right here even if you're not in that age range if you're single it's not that just young people struggle single old people struggle single Amen. Amen. if this mic on turn my music down Amen. 
Old people struggle single. Amen. Don't let them 30 year old, 40 year old, 50 year old, don't let that gray hair fool you. Underneath all that gray hair is a struggle. Underneath that gray hair is somebody who is battling. Underneath that gray hair is somebody who is missing somebody that they used to be married to. And I got this empty space right here. And now I used to be married. And now I'm single. And I'm trying to figure out how to navigate this bold new world. Child, it done changed out here. It done changed out here. It ain't the same thing it was. If you've been married over 20 years and now you're divorced, it's a bold new world. Am I talking right? Amen. So if you're in here and you're single and you're not in the age of 18 to 25, I want you up here too. You ain't fooling me. I want you up here too. I want you up here too. I want you up here too. Let these young people know it ain't just me. It ain't just them. It ain't a young people's problem. It's an old people's problem. Child, I was so shocked when some of these old people come in here. Some of them come in on a cane. Talking about, Pastor, I'm struggling with that man. What? You? Lift your hands to God right here. God, God is going to change some mindsets in here. Your discontentment, your frustration, your lack of satisfaction is messing up your choices. It's causing you to be in the same situations over and over. Different names, same nonsense. Different color, same nonsense. At some point, you have to realize that the issue is not the people that I've talked to or the people that I've chosen. The issue is me. One sister said to me, I keep on picking the wrong people. I said, that's your problem. It's the people you pick. It ain't the people that God picked. It's the people you picked. And you want to get mad and say, ain't no good men. And I hear the brother say, ain't no good women out here. They don't cook. They don't clean. They don't keep themselves together. They crazy. They chicken heads. Hey, brother, ain't nothing wrong with the sisters out here. It's the women you chose. You chose that nonsense. You chose that craziness. It's a whole lot of good ones out here. Where are my good women at? Y'all act like y'all scared. If you a good woman and you know it, I didn't say a perfect woman. If you a good woman and you know it, how at your boy? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Lift your hands right here. I want to pray for you. I don't want to go into a preach. I just want to pray. I just want to pray for you. I want to pray for you in this season. We are fighting over your destiny. The future that you will enjoy will be predicated on the decisions you make today.